now uh, we will see the pathologies okay so these rod spots are present in sub acute bacterial endocarditis sub acute bacterial endocarditis this is again a question that was asked in neat 2018 this question was asked okay now see this is actually a rod spot how rod spot looks like this is a single rod spot so rod spot is actually uh this this is a rod spot okay so what is actually this rod spot can you see we have got a single hemorrhage and you have got a whitish dot this is the whitish dot the whitish dot in the center so this whitish dot actually represents the fibrin clot this represents the fibrin clot while the rod spots represents the multiple multiple superficial hemorrhages with the this fibrin clot or a whitish dot in the center in the center so if when you are having multiple superficial hemorrhages with a whitish dot that is your fibrin clot in the center this is called as rod spot the rod spot is found in subacute bacterial endocarditis due to the retinal hypoxia it is present due to the retinal hypoxia so whenever a patient of bacterial endocarditis is actually uh, admitted in the medicine ward they will always uh, you know request the fundus view in order to see that if retinal hypoxia is taking place and whether you have rod spots so this is the integration you can get a integrated question on medicine and ophthal pertaining to these rod spots then after this the second is your vitreous hemorrhage the second is the vitreous hemorrhage now let me show you the vitreous hemorrhage this is how the vitreous hemorrhage actually looks like can you see this is blood actually can you see this is the blood so this is actually the vitreous vitreous hemorrhage that is you have got blood in the vitreous cavity you have blood in the vitreous cavity so when you have blood in the vitreous cavity how will this patient present there will be diminution of vision now will it be sudden or it will be gradual it is sudden this is your sudden painless diminution of vision very very important if you look at the clinical scenarios that i have given in the youtube videos every question will always give you a clue that what kind of vision loss it is whether it is acute that is sudden or it is gradual it is progressive or stationary it is painful or painless so that will give you a lot of clue that what is the kind of vision loss and what is the pathology behind it that the patient is having second important thing whenever you have this sudden painless diminution of vision always think of posterior segment sudden painless diminution of vision 99.9% of the times it will give you a pathology of posterior segment so always think about posterior segment then now if you look at the clinical features if the patient is having vitreous hemorrhage what will be the clinical features so one will be sudden painless diminution of vision number 2 i will have floaters i told you floaters in the 
uveitis also the patient will see the black spots whenever you have something you know abnormal uh, it can be abnormal cells or it can be blood in the vitreous cavity clumps are formed in the vitreous due to the clumping in the vitreous gel there will be clumping in the vitreous gel and these clumps will be seen as floaters or the black spots then the third thing the third thing will be the absence of the fundal glow there will be absence of the fundal glow that is no red glow i will not see the red glow there i will not see the red glow because this hemorrhage that the blood in the vitreous will actually cover these red glow which is coming due to the choreo capillaries so whenever you have vitreous hemorrhage you will have sudden painless diminution of vision you will have floaters and you will also have the absence of the fundal glow now looking at the etiology looking at the etiology so if you look at the etiology of the vitreous hemorrhage let me see how to do it okay there are two kind of etiologies if you look here the most common cause of the vitreous hemorrhage so if they ask you the most common cause of vitreous hemorrhage then the answer is spontaneous that is like most of the time you do not know what is exact cause so that is spontaneous this is followed by the trauma this is followed by the trauma so the most common cause of the vitreous hemorrhage is spontaneous so most of the time you do not know what is exact cause followed by the trauma in the known cases now another question is most common cause of the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage now obviously if the vitreous hemorrhage is occurring you know repeatedly then you have to think about certain pathologies so in that case i can think of two pathologies if it is a young individual then it can be the eels disease and if it is a elderly person elderly person then we have to think about the pdr then you have to think about the pdr pdr means the proliferative diabetic retinopathy i'll be dealing with this proliferative diabetic retinopathy at large so whenever they are asking you the etiology of the vitreous hemorrhage see whether they are asking you just the vitreous hemorrhage or whether they are asking you about the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage the recurrent uh, vitreous hemorrhage in the young people we have the eels disease and in the elderly people we have the pdr now what is this actually eels disease eels disease uh, is actually occurring due to the hypersensitivity reaction it is occurring due to the hypersensitivity reaction to the tubercular proteins due to the hypersensitivity reaction to the tb proteins or the tubercular proteins and you have to concentrate that this is not due to infection rather it is due to a hypersensitivity reaction and uh, hypersensitivity reaction is a inflammatory yes it is a inflammatory reaction that is why the treatment of choice of the eels disease again this is a very very important question if they ask you what is the treatment of choice then the answer is steroids okay it is the steroids and not the att you can add or not the att with or without att but steroids are definitely the treatment of choice very very important so what will be the cause what will be the presentation etiology and the treatment 
ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ पीडीआर वी विल बी लुकिंग एट इन द डायबिटिक रेटनोपैथी इटसेल्फ ओके सो दिस वाज योर रॉड स्पॉट्स एंड विट्रियस हेमरेज नाउ कमिंग टू द सी आर ए ओ नाउ कमिंग टू सी आर ए ओ दिस इज योर सेंट्रल रेटेनल आर्टीरियोलर occlusion central retinal arteriolar occlusion it is a very very important condition central retinal arteriolar occlusion it is a ophthalmic emergency it is a ophthalmic emergency why it is a emergency because central retinal artery is a dividing into the four end arteries the central retinal artery divides into four end arteries there will be no collaterals so if there is occlusion in the central retinal artery you will not get the blood supply you will not have anastomosis you do not have collaterals and that is why this is a emergency condition most common cause most common cause is uh, thrombosis followed by the embolism so mostly you know it is the thromboembolism a clot uh, plaque atherosclerosis a cholesterol plaque all these things are responsible for the occlusion of central retinal artery in 80% of the cases it is the thrombosis while in 20% of the cases it is the embolism and you know that these conditions are more common in males more than 50 years of age so we are expecting the central retinal arteriolar occlusion we are expecting this central retinal arteriolar occlusion after uh, after 50 years of age especially in the males and uh, this thromboembolism is uh, actually taking place due to the cholesterol cholesterol crystals mostly it is taking place due to the cholesterol crystals which are called as hollen horse plaques these are called as the hollen horse plaques this is again a very important question the hollen horse plaques what are these thromboembolism right then uh, if you look at the site the most common site of occlusion is your lamina cribrosa the most common site of occlusion is the lamina cribrosa that part of the sclera through which the optic nerve fibers are coming out that is the most common site of occlusion now looking at clinical features so again it is a posterior segment pathology vascular occlusions are always painless you do not have the nerve supply there so again this patient will present with the sudden painless loss of vision now obviously optic nerve was the main nerve for vision optic disc is supplied by the central retinal artery so i will have sudden painless complete loss of vision RAPD present. What is RAPD? This we will be discussing in neuro of thal. Okay, don't bother about it. RAPD present. This is due to the optic nerve defect because it is a optic nerve disease. Therefore, you get the RAPD present, a pupillary defect. You are getting. Now, if you look at the signs, in the signs you have got two important things. one is the cherry red spot you have got the cherry red spot and second is the cattle track appearance cherry red spot and cattle track appearance are two important signs that you are going to get in cases of the cro very very important now first try to see why we get the cherry red spot this is your fundus okay now 
because of the CRU, what you are going to get? You are going to get the pale retina. So, I am getting this uh, pale kind of a retina here. Something like this. Now, because we are having the CRAO, you are getting the pale retina. Okay. And this is yellowish in color. So, this becomes milky white in color. This is becoming milky white in color. Why it is milky white in color? Due to the exudate collection. Due to the exudate collection in the ganglionic cell layer. GCL means ganglionic cell layer. Now, do you remember that this ganglionic cell layer was not present in fovea and foveola? So, this ganglionic cell layer is absent in the fovea centralis. Right? It is absent in fovea centralis. So, no exudate collection in fovea centralis. Therefore, what happens? The fovea continues to shine red because there are two reasons. First of all, this fovea centralis ganglionic cell layer is absent and the second is that it is supplied by the it is supplied by the chorio capillaries. It is supplied by the chorio capillaries. So, ganglionic cell layer is absent and it is getting the blood from the chorio capillaries. So, only area which continues to shine through which the choroid continues to sh remain shining is your fovea centralis. So, this spot is actually called as the cherry red spot. So, this cherry red spot is actually not pathological. It is rather normal. It is the only area through which only area through which choroid continues to shine. Rest of the area is hidden because of the exudate collection in the ganglionic cell layer. Ganglionic cell layer is absent in fovea centralis. It is supplied by the chorio capillaries. Therefore, through the fovea centralis, choroid is the only, uh, this fovea centralis is the only place. Fovea centralis is the only place through which Therefore, the fovea centralis is the only place through which the choroid continues to shine. This spot is called as the cherry red spot. So, very very important. Why do you get the cherry red spot? Now, another important thing is your DD of cherry red spot. Where do you get the cherry red spot? What is the DD of cherry red spot? The DD of cherry red spot is the cherry trees never grows tall in sand and the mud. Cherry trees never grows tall in sand and mud. This is C for CRAO, T for Tay-Sachs disease. Then N for Neiman pig disease. Then you have G. G is for gangliosidosis. And also we have Gaucher's disease. Then uh, we have a T for trauma. This is your blunt trauma. Blunt trauma shows the macular edema. Blunt trauma shows the macular edema. Where do you, where you get this cherry red spot? It is also called as the Berlin's edema. It is also called as the Berlin's edema. Then you have this sand. This is your uh, Sandhoff disease. 
and then we have mud this is your metachromatic metachromatic leucodystrophy so this is a easy way a mnemonic for learning the dds of cherry red spot very very important every other time you get the question related to it so these things are there according to the other features also you will calculate and you will uh, reach to the final diagnosis what is the exact cause of cherry red spot here now another important thing is that uh, this gaucher's disease gaucher's disease actually shows the pseudo pseudo cherry red spot so whenever you have to decide that uh, which one to choose and which one to leave you have to keep this in mind that the cherry red spot that you get in cases of gaucher's disease is not a true cherry red spot so you have looked why you have cherry red spot what is the dd of cherry red spot now we'll try to treat it number 1 you have to do the immediate immediate lowering of the intraocular pressure now the first thing that you have to do is immediate lowering of the intraocular pressure why i want to decrease the intraocular pressure to dislodge the thrombus it is very important to dislodge the thrombus so immediately you have to decrease the intraocular pressure so that thrombus is dislodged from the lamina cribrosa so for this i will use iv root iv mannitol i can use iv acetazolamide both i am using i am not using them one by one like we were doing in glaucoma because this is ultimate of thalamic emergency so i will have to use both then we can also give the ocular massage we can also do the ocular massage and we can also do the paracentesis we can also do the paracentesis paracentesis means we will do the aspiration of the anterior chamber we will remove the aqueous so obviously if you are aspirating the aqueous humor out of the anterior chamber certainly it will bring down the intraocular pressure side by side you are giving mannitol also you are decreasing the vitreous volume you are decreasing the aqueous volume you are doing the massaging then number 2 we have to give the carbol mixture number 2 we give the carbol mixture carbol mixture uh, we use 95% oxygen plus the 5% co2 carbol mixture consists of 95% oxygen plus the 5% co2 uh, this is given for the vaso dilatation this is uh, given for the vaso dilatation now a important question is that why i am adding this 5% co2 so this 5% co2 is added to maintain the respiratory drive in order to maintain the respiratory drive it is important to add 5% co2 otherwise what will happen if you give high uh, like 100% oxygen if i give 100 percent oxygen then this will cause respiratory depression so in order to prevent this respiratory depression we add 5 percent co2 then number 3 we gave iv steroids because uh, obviously there is lot of inflammation lot of exudate collection and we also give the anticoagulants we are also giving the anticoagulants so because you know uh, the main reason for this arteriolar occlusion was actually the thrombosis and the embolism so obviously you will have to give the systemic treatment as well so for this i am giving the anticoagulants so we can give like uh, streptokinase uh, we can use the streptokinase or we can give the urokinase or tissue plasminogen activator that is tpa we can give tissue plasminogen activator also or uh, we can also uh, do the embololysis we can also do the 
embololysis. So, all this systemic treatment. So, I think uh, whenever the patient has CRAO, the ophthalmology people, the emergency critical care people, medicine people, all are actually treating them combinedly. And uh, because, you know, uh, the patient first usually appears with us because of the sudden loss of vision, but uh, we will have to give him a multi-systemic therapy. Otherwise, there will be a problem, right? So, I think this is clear. Is this very, very clear? So, this was your CRO. Now, coming to the next, that is your CRVO. Now, after the CRO, we have CRVO, that is central retinal venous occlusion. Central retinal venous occlusion it is. So, this is actually less severe. But it is more common than the CRAO. If you compare it with CRAO, it is less severe. And this is always, you know, nature's balance that the less severe things are more common and the more severe things are less common. Because if more severe things occur, occur, occur more commonly, everyone will be uh, sick only and busy in the hospital only. So, this is the balance always going on. Now, if you look at uh, the types of the CRVO, we have got mainly two types. Non-ischemic variety. We have the non-ischemic variety and uh, then we have got the ischemic variety. Non-ischemic and ischemic variety. Now, as the name is suggesting, the non-ischemic variety will only show the mild changes. So, this is going to show only the mild changes. Uh, if I talk about uh, the hemorrhages or if I talk of the edema or uh, the tortuosity, all these things will be actually mild. Okay. So, therefore, there will be no treatment that is required. So, most of the time we do not require any treatment. Most of the times, you know, collaterals are established. So, there is no ischemia in the retina. But when these changes are more severe. So, when you have severe changes, okay, you have got uh, like severe edema, you have got severe hemorrhages, you have got severe tortuosity. So, everything is severe. So, if everything is very, very severe, then what will happen? You will have a lot of ischemia. And when we have a lot of ischemia, what will happen? There will be release of vascular endothelial growth factor. So, this ischemia will lead to a release of a factor, vascular endothelial growth factor. And this will lead to the neovascularization. This will lead to neovascularization and that is why if you remember we were having the neovascular glaucoma also. It is in the ischemic variety of the CRVO that we have lot of you know release of this vascular endothelial growth factor that is actually leading to the neovascular glaucoma. So, neovascular glaucoma can occur as a complication. This can occur as a complication of ischemic CRVO, also called as 100-day glaucoma. It is also called as the 100-day glaucoma. So, what is happening whenever, you know, you have lot of um, neovascularization, there will be what you called as the vitreous hemorrhage. So, because you know the new blood vessels are very, very fragile and they are very quick to bleed. So, you have a lot of vitreous hemorrhage in the fundus. So, this gives you the typical splashed tomato. This gives you the typical splashed tomato appearance. So, while we were having the cherry red spot in the CRAO, we have the splashed 
tomato appearance, thunderstorm appearance, ketchup sauce appearance means as if you know uh, the tomato has been squeezed over the fundus, whole of the fundus is red that is called as the splashed tomato appearance. So obviously this will require the treatment. So what treatment I can give? Laser photocoagulation. So I will have to laser the vessels which are bleeding so that they stop bleeding. So I will give laser photocoagulation. So this is your CRAO and CRVO. CRAO and CRVO. Is this clear to everyone? You can identify the CRAO and CRVO. See this one. This is your cherry red spot. Can you see the pale retina? Surrounding retina is pale and we have got one area which is still red. So this one area which is still red, this is your fovea centralis where the choroid is still shining. Where the choroid is still shining. So this is CRAO. While if you look at the other thing, this is your splashed tomato appearance. Can you see whole of the retina is just red. This is your splashed tomato appearance and this is found in ischemic CRVO. Ischemic CRVO. Right? One thing I uh, omitted. I forgot to, to uh, tell you there was one more sign here that was your cattle track appearance. So uh, you can write at a space if you are left or you can note down somewhere I forgot to tell you that. So what is actually the cattle track appearance? You also get the cattle track appearance in the CRAO. So this is actually the segmentation of segmentation of the blood column in the veins. Whenever you have arteriolar occlusion, you will get the blood in the veins which is segmented. Suppose I will use the blue color to show you the vein. Suppose this is your vein. Then inside the veins, there is actually segmentation of the blood. So, this appearance is called as the cattle track appearance. Jab, uh, uh, like um, uh, this um, herd of cows or sheep or goats are passing through the forest. They are like herd they are going. So, it is giving you the same appearance. That is why it is called as a cattle track appearance. And another important thing is that the retinal hypoxia time. Retinal hypoxia time is the 60 to 90 minutes. So if the retina is not perfused for this much period for 1 to 1 and a half hour, then you will get permanent hypoxic retinopathy, permanent changes will be there. So these two things you can note down. So rod spots, vitreous amrit, CRAO and CRVO, is it very very clear, right? Now we will be doing the next thing. Have you written this? Now we will be doing the next thing and uh, that is your hypertension retinopathy. Hypertension retinopathy. So all those people who are having you know chronic hypertension like BP is uh, more than 140 by 90 for such a long period, these people can show you the changes of retinopathy. So what is the earliest sign? The earliest sign of the hypertension retinopathy is the nasal angiospasm. It is the nasal angiospasm. Nasal is the quadrant. So, first to obtain is in the nasal quadrant. Angio means the vessel and spasm means the thinning. Thinning of blood vessels first in the nasal quadrant you are going to get. This nasal angiospasm that you are getting. This nasal angiospasm is directly 
proportional to the severity of the hypertension. So, if I am having more severity of hypertension, I will have more nasal angiospasm. If I have less, then I will have the less angiospasm. So, this is directly proportional. Now, this was your first change. Now, coming to the second. The second is the arterio, arteriosclerosis. Now, again, this consists of two words the arterio and sclerosis. So, this is present in the arteries and sclerosis means you have thickening. So, here you have arteriosclerosis, you have thickening of the arteries which will lead to increase in the total peripheral resistance. This will lead to the increase in the total peripheral resistance that is TPR. Now, if you have more of the resistance to the flow of the blood, this is your simple pathology, you will have increase in the diastolic BP. So, you will have more and more diastolic BP and if I have more of diastolic BP, I will have more angiospasm. Then I will have more angiospasm. So, I think this will be a vicious circle. So, more angiospasm, then more again more arteriosclerosis, again more total peripheral resistance, again the hypertension. So, this arteriosclerosis is directly proportional to the duration, to the duration of the hypertension. It is directly proportional to the duration of hypertension. This is directly proportional to the duration of hypertension. So, we had the nasal angiospasm, then second is arteriosclerosis. I hope you people are getting this. This is your uh, pathology with Dovtel. Yes. Then number three. Number three is increase vascular permeability. Increased vascular permeability. Now, slowly and gradually, because you know you have an endothelial damage, due to that endothelial damage, you have increased vascular permeability. Now, due to this increased vascular permeability, you will have the changes of hypertension retinopathy. Uh, that is, you will have the flame shaped hemorrhages, then you have the cotton wool spots and the retinal edema. Flame shaped hemorrhages, cotton wool spots and the retinal edema. Flame shaped hemorrhages are superficial hemorrhages. Cotton wool spots, these are the soft exudates and we have the retinal edema. Why is there angiospasm? Angiospasm is due to that is actually the reaction to the raised pressure. Inside the vessels when the pressure is more, this is the reaction which they are showing. Number second, nasal may, uh, if you uh, go back to the glaucoma also, there are uh, also, we had seen that the changes were more on the nasal side. Actually, there are many theories which are being given for this that why it is more common on the nasal side. Some people say because, you know, optic disc is slightly tilted. That is why it is more uh, dominating over the nasal side. So, nevertheless, we do not know the exact reason. But yes, changes always takes more commonly on the nasal side first. Okay. Now, these hemorrhages actually take the shape of the flame. That is why they are called as the flame hemorrhages. Cotton wool spots, if you see cotton wool spots, these are the soft exudates which look like the balls of the cotton wool. That is why these are called as the cotton wool spots. And uh, both of these are present in the nerve fiber layer of the retina. 
both of them are present in the nerve fiber layer of the retina so they are spreading horizontally in the nerve fiber layer that is why it is called as flame shaped hemorrhages so the flame shaped hemorrhages in the cotton wool spots are the important markers of the hypertension retinopathy okay now coming to the keith wegner and the barker stages of the hypertension retinopathy the keith wegner and barker stages of hypertension retinopathy so the first stage shows the mild angiospasm here we just have the mild angiospasm where the av ratio from 2 is to 3 changes to 1 is to 3 this is your stage number 1 while in stage number 2 we have moderate angiospasm and along with this you have the salus sign now i will tell you what is this okay wait then you have stage number 3 in the stage 3 you have cop per wiring of the arterioles copper wiring of the arterioles plus the grade 2 changes plus you have gun sign and bonnet sign gun sign and bonnet sign so what is a normal av ratio then it is changing where do you get the salus sign where do you get the gun sign where do you get the bonnet sign and uh, then you have stage 4 here you get the silver wiring silver wiring of the arterioles silver wiring of the arterioles we are getting along with the silver wiring you get the grade 3 changes here all grade 3 changes plus you will have papilledema papilledema is the marker of stage 4 hypertension so whether you have the silver wiring or not but if you have papilledema you will always consider it to be a marker of stage 4 hypertension or malignant hypertension then uh, you should know what is actually the copper wiring what is silver wiring now one by one we'll be discussing all these things now first try to understand what is the silver wiring and copper wiring see when the spasm takes place there will be change of color there will be change of the color so this change of color in the blood vessel will take place okay so initially when it is having lot of blood that will be your bright red in color then you have mild change so you will have dark red dark red then you will have the copper color this is the grade 3 that is copper wiring you are getting and then finally no blood so when you have ultimate thinning you are getting no blood this is your silver wiring this is called as the silver wiring that is stage 4 
so the copper wiring means the color of the blood inside the vessel appears dark bronze color that is your copper colored and ultimately when so much thinning is there it appears as if you do not have blood inside it just tar jaise blood vessels dikh rahe hain therefore it is called as silver wiring so it has nothing to do with the gold and silver it is just the appearance copper wiring silver wiring this is one thing now second thing is that you were having the three signs this is actually the tapering or the deflection when you have tapering of the veins or the deflection of the veins with respect to the av crossing now first try to understand what is this av crossing where a artery and a vein are crossing each other so where a artery and a vein are crossing each other they are due to the hypertension you have the vein going tapered or deflecting so if it is at the av crossing then it is called as the salus sign number 2 if it is distal to the av crossing then it is called as the bonnet sign and when it is perpendicular to the av crossing then it is called as gun sign now how to learn this sallu is salman khan it is the nickname of salman khan salman khan ne accident kiya tha crossing pe traffic lights pe so it is at the av crossing bonnet think of the car bonnet car bonnet is present on the distal side so this is distal then the gun think about the model of the gun so it is perpendicular so this is gun so by these are only the mnemonics okay nothing to do with the reality in this way you can learn the signs in this way you can learn the signs is this clear so you have got the signs of uh, hypertension you have grades of hypertension you have uh, copper wiring silver wiring and what are the different you know signs alu sign gun sign bonnet sign another important thing is that the most common cause of diminution of vision in the hypertension retinopathy so if the patient is having the diminution of vision in the hypertension retinopathy then the most common cause is the maculopathy it is the macular involvement not papilledema papilledema is the marker of malignant hypertension but it is not the most common cause of diminution of vision in the hypertension retinopathy again a very important thing so don't club the two things the most common cause of diminution of vision in the hypertension retinopathy is a maculopathy but uh, uh, papilledema is the marker of stage 4 hypertension